Chief, respected member secretary IGNC, Dr. Sachidananda Joshi, respected director, National Mission for Manuscripts, Professor Prathapanand Jha, respected speaker of the day, Mr. Anupam Shah, respected chairperson, Dr. S.P. Singh, and all the participants who are attending this program today. India has immense treasure of manuscripts, which covers knowledge in every field, starting from philosophy, science, medicine, literature, art, music, and many other. Hence, it can boast of its rich old heritage. National Mission for Manuscripts was established in 2003 by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, with objectives to locate all these invaluable manuscripts all over India, to document them for national record, to conserve those manuscripts so that they are not destroyed, to digitize those manuscripts in order to create an e-library so that interested scholars can make use of the knowledge contained in those manuscripts, and thus to disseminate the knowledge content of the manuscripts through publication also. Amongst various activities in order to fulfill these objectives, the mission organizes Tattabadu lectures, where eminent scholars deliver lectures on the topic related to manuscripts. These lectures are published by the mission under its Tattabadu series. Today, in this virtual Tattabadu lecture, the NMM, the National Mission for Manuscripts, present Rang Rasayan. <coughs> Colors in Manuscripts and Miniatures of the Indian Subcontinent, an illustrated presentation by Sri Anupam Shah, who is an expert on the subject. <clears throat> Exquisitely illustrated manuscripts and miniature paintings have been created along the length and breadth of the Indian subcontinent. While brilliant and learned scholars have enriched with the knowledge in the written text, there is definitely an in, there is definitely an expansive space for much greater awareness of the delightful Indian heritage of colors, dyes, and binders, and how it is entwined with the lives of our people. This lecture will introduce the world of colors that enliven the manuscripts and painting heritage of India. Sri Anupam Shah, today's speaker, is an art conservation practitioner, strategist and educator, heritage conservation consultant and trainer to various Indian and international institutions. He is the founder secretary of Himalayan Society for Heritage and Art Conservation, Uttarakhand and ex advisor conservation of the mission. Presently, Anupam Shah is the head of art conservation research and training at Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahalai, Mumbai. Today's program will be chaired by Dr. S.P. Singh, former director conservation of National Museum, New Delhi. Dr. Singh graduated from St. Stephen's College and did postgraduate in chemistry from IIT Delhi. He underwent UNESCO training for conservation of antiques. He served in senior positions for more than 38 years in National Museum, National Archives and Archaeological Survey of India in the field of conservation of art object and monument. He was on the teaching faculty at National Museum Institute of Heritage Management, New Delhi and Archaeological Survey of India. Presently, Dr. Singh is the advisor and technical consultant to Shiramani Gurdwara Prabhandak Committee, Amritsar and the Golden Temple, Amritsar. He is also the chairman of Kosturba Gandhi Museum and Mahadev Desai Library, Harijan Sevak Sangh, Kingsway Camp, Delhi. Now I hand over the meeting to Dr. S.P. Singh, the chairperson of today's program. Good evening, everybody. I am delighted that the organizers of the National Monastery Mission and IGNCA has invited me to chair this particular session on Rangrasayan, 
colors in manuscripts and Indian miniatures of the Indian subcontinent. We are taking a subcontinent as a whole. It's another important thing that we are taking the entire area in Indian sub subcontinent into picture. I am delighted that respected Satyanand Joshi ji, respected P. Jha ji, and Madam respected Sangamitra Basu and others have invited me to chair this particular session. This is a going to be a technical lecture, but I request Anupamji not to go to the tech, too many technicalities because we have art lovers from the other fields also. I know Mr. Anupam Shah since long, he was our student in the National Museum, one of the brilliant students, I would say. And uh, I had big hopes at that time in 1991. So he's now emerged as one of the experts in the field. And I'm delighted that that is to have him here today, chairing, uh, speaking on this subject of uh, importance in our field. Now about the NMM, I've been associated with the NMM since long, 2003 since inception, but in the form of lectures, in the form of training programs, in the form of making a formulation policy in the National Conservation Manuscripts and so many activities across the country. I'm very much pleased to hear that this subject of importance is being highlighted today itself. And you see, I'm not speaking about the subject because subject domain is Anupam Shah will be commenting after this lecture, after lecture about the various challenges that we face eventually over the course of his lecture and issues of that time. I'm delighted that the National Monastery Mission done her commendable work. If you go to the website, you will find number of activities that the National Monastery Mission has formed, especially Madam Sangamitra Vasu's publication. I must say, Sangamitra Vasu has been the backboard of the publication department. I remember there is a book called Vijayana Nidhi. Am I right spelling? Vijayana Nidhi containing the 40 rare manuscripts of the country. Immense all collections and <coughs> the, 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 most of the people do not know that the Rigveta is located in the Oriental Bandarnaike Institute in Pune and that is also in Birch Park. These 40 manuscripts, kindly go through them. You'll be, you'll be pleased to see the, the, the the, the informations contained in them. Then uh, another publication is Shabad Guru. Shabad Guru, Madam Ji, remember, I have collected you so many times. I went to you to give me a copy. The gentleman, my colleague, Dr. Minder Singh, hasn't got the copy. I have got the copy. So he asked me, as Singh, you have got the first copy. How do you keep <laughs> everything on your own? Anyway, Shabad Guru in four volumes. This is a credit of Mr. Sangmitra Basu. Again, she has been doing. And then Another thing, very, very important nowadays, saving India's medical manuscripts. Medical manuscripts in India are in thousands spread all over the country. Now we are working on the manuscripts. What is the wisdom and knowledge content in this? In few years back in 2004, I remember, there were many undocumented Palmerese manuscripts lo surveyed, located in the Odisha. And they all are on medical. I'm sorry that people, now we talk of COVID. Everything is written on those rare manuscripts. Everything is there on the immunity levels, but we have not studied it. Even people do not know that they contain the wealth of information, wisdom and everything on human anatomy, on uh, medical science, on every field of life, environment, pollution, everything. Then, um, <clears throat> then, then uh, they have surveyed across all over the country these uh, these information. So I will not uh, talk of uh, the whole thing, but got, I, but I see, you see, and uh, this information 
and the wisdom contained. And they have surveyed about three lakhs, more than three lakhs manuscripts, wealth of the country. I wish such publications are brought out again and again, uh, brought out by the publication department and people should know and study them in detail and find out the immunity things that we are talking of nowadays because of COVID. And that immunity will come from our rare manuscripts, from palm leaves, from birch bark, from handmade mark, so many materials which we are talking just now. So, uh, Mr. Anupam Shah will be talking of the colors in miniature and painting. Now, what is the color meaning? Color is not something of the body. It is a that I will tell. Body <laughs> Sorry. So that he will be talking. We'll be, I'll be interacting uh, during uh, the course of the lecture or end of your lecture. End of what? End of lecture. Okay. Thank you very much. I have talked too much. Uh, I hand over the mic to my colleague, Mr. Anupam Shah, to start this, this lecture on the younger science colors in manuscripts and Indian miniature paintings in the Indian subcontinent. Mr. Anupam Shah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. S.P. Singh. Thank you so much and um, for your enthusiastic uh, introduction. And it is very clear that you understand the field, especially when you have the background of chemistry, that, that too from a premier institution like the IIT. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sangamitra Basu for this. Uh, I would like to begin with first welcoming all of you, and uh, it's um, it's a privilege to accept this invitation uh, by the member secretary IGNCA Dr. Sachidanand um, Joshi ji and the director NMM uh, Dr. Pratapanand Jha. Um, uh, I would like to begin by um, uh, straight away uh, showing you what uh, the region is that we are going to be addressing in this next 40 minutes. So uh, this is the area of the Indian subcontinent where uh, a variety of manuscripts and miniature paintings are extant and uh, have been taken up uh, for this uh, in the preparation of the lecture for today. And all of you here who are attending this session today, thank you very much. Some of you are in different countries and different places and the skies above you are all of different colors. And um, human beings um, have uh, always aspired looking at the expanse of the sky or looking at the expanse of the ocean. And they've always had this very intrinsic sort of a desire to express themselves. Uh, they express themselves by, by touch, they express themselves by glances, they express themselves by sound, and also expressing themselves in terms of externalization of their experiences, of their memories. And the first surfaces they had with them were the rock surfaces in the rock shelters and the caves across the world. This incidentally is a rock shelter from Lake Hamoda in um, Orissa in the Jharsuguda and Sundargarh districts of uh, the western uh, regions of Orissa. And if you see here, see people have expressed themselves through color, obviously. We see browns here, we see images with white and we see yellow. And this is a recurring thing that we will see across uh, the rock arts of the world, the browns and the yellows and the whites. If that was 20 to 30,000 years ago, we go about uh, 3,000 years uh, BC and you have um, uh, this uh, terracotta pot, uh, which is painted again with a green and a yellow and a red from the Indus Valley, uh, from the Balochistan area where the Indus Valley civilization flourished over an expansive area at that time, about 5,000 years ago. Moving further into time, further closer to us, about 1500 years ago, we had um, people expressed um, by embellishing um, sculptures in the round. Uh, this is in Stucco. So you have the red ochre, as you can see on the edge of the head. At the back of the head, we have lines of red ochre near the ears and we have 
uh, red on, at the point at the junction of the forehead and the uh, and the hair of Buddha. This is from the CSMVS collection. And then when we see other than this red ochre and the black and the yellow that we saw, this is uh, an exquisite site, which is something that we must strive to visit because it talks of the, the phenomenal potential of human endeavor. Uh, this is about 2200 years ago. It, uh, of course, the work was spread over a few centuries. And these are the famous World Heritage Sites, the Ajanta Caves uh, near the village of Ajita in uh, near Aurangabad in Maharashtra in India. And this phenomenal complex of caves is replete with paintings of a very, very high order. And here we see the flowering of the colors. We have the blues and the greens and the reds and the various hues coming forth uh, with great perspective, with depth, with everything. And these are all huge wall paintings. These are thousands and thousands of square feet of wall paintings on ceilings, on verandas, on walls. And from this large surface of wall paintings, which, which, were, which were created in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. If that was towards the southern, central, southern part of India, this is up in the northwestern uh, areas of Ladakh, in the Jammu Kashmir, what was um, the western part of India where the, um, uh, the Buddhist traditions flourished in Kashmir, uh, all the way in Afghanistan from where you saw the stucco sculptures. Here the sculptures are huge. The scale of the polychromy is, um, is grand. That's a wall painting, right? And all this in due course of time was then transferred onto, we are talking now coming to a smaller format of manuscripts. And we're coming to a smaller format of paintings which were held in the hand and looked at and not really framed up on a wall as we do in museums today. So this is written in black on a birch bark from the mountain regions, not yet deciphered in black. And then we have the writing on the leaves, the patra, the folio, the word folio for the pages comes from folio as in the leaf. So these here showing a surface written on top is a surface written leaf where the ink is taken with an instrument, a writing instrument and written on top of the surface. The one below the image below is where a metal stylus has been taken and the writing has been incised on the surface of the manuscript, on the, on the surface of the palm leaf folio. They're both palm leaf folios. And it is also interesting to see that your technique of creating these works also stems from the nature of the support. If they created cuneiform writing on the tablets, It was because wedges of wood created those cuneiform shapes on that clay surface. On the palm leaf surface on which we are surface writing, the leapy or the text is straight and horizontal. Whereas on the palm leaf, if you incise it straight and horizontal, you'll tear the leaf. That's why all the writings here, whether you go to the you see the Puskolopothi in Sri Lanka or you see in uh, Tamil Nadu or Keral or up in uh, Orissa, uh, they're all rounded writings. So I think the way a person treated a work of art also depended much on the support which was provided to work on. So here again, black is predominant, right? With some reds, often red ochre. And when we talk about when we talk about um, the antiquity of Indian painting, we often feel that when there were so many texts and manuscripts, where were the writings that talked about 
creating works of art or the treatment of of color or the collection of the pigments and the um, creation of the grounds and the execution of the uh, the likhai or the writing or the painting because these were terms which merged into each other so we have this series of various texts right from the 5th century to um, uh, to commentaries right up to the 20th century and these are the various texts which you can refer to in almost any book that you get about indian uh, books and uh, in, on indian painting and all they talked about interestingly was while there were certain references to pigments and colors the predominant narration was about colors the color of the wing of bumblebee the color of the cloud laden with water right the color of the wing of a bird so for the whites a series of descriptions of colors for the whites a series of descriptions of color for the blues and so on but we must remember colors is a perception it is almost mayavi it is an illusion human being see color differently animals see color differently amongst us humans we may see color differently the color may seem different because of another color which is beside it or surrounding it right so the color perception is not something that um we should uh, enjoy it right but when it comes to talking about what are the colors used in indian paintings or any paintings of the world i think the technical term that people go often to is pigments or dyes and let us clarify right now that pigments are powders which do not dissolve in water or in the medium in which you paint they do not dissolve they remain suspended in it these are pigments and dyes are those that dissolve in the medium or the or the solvent or the water and they go into solution this is the primary difference between these two and i say this particularly because when we talk about indian painting even today everybody from students to people who are at work in institutions we often say or the the lay person the perception is oh indian paintings of ancient times so oh, they used a lot of vegetable colors we will see that vegetable colors are few and far between when it came to painting surfaces so there are certain things that we must uh, not keep perpetuating right even when we teach to our students i think it's time we checked out certain facts just like ajanta frescoes they are not frescoes but we have perpetuated this thing for decades and decades and decades it's time to correct it now we'll talk about the pigments the primary pigment the first pigment that comes into play anywhere in the world is red ochre or geru this is a drawing on a wall with red ochre right and this i show because this is the same one where red ochre has been used in varying dilutions to give you the different shades so with red ochre and with black you can and india has created exquisite works of art on big surfaces like walls as well as in small uh, minute surfaces and red ochre is the mother of all pigments i won't call it color now red ochre is the mother of all colors and everywhere in the world people associate with it on an extremely uh, personal level it is not a pigment that has to be acquired from somewhere it is pigment which you can just pick up from the earth around you or to near a uh, slopes of a hill uh, beside you and you use it in a quotidian fashion you use it every day for rituals in the homes and you use it for fine art works and you use it to also embellish your the exteriors of the house and the floors and the walls be it tribal areas or rural areas semi urban or urban areas this is geru red ochre iron oxide it's earth it's pure earth 
you take it, you put it on a surface, you put some water on it, and you grind it slowly. It doesn't take much effort. In fact, this lady was a newlywed bride in this village in Orissa. And when, because there was a program where people were making pigments, so the ladies of the village said, no, no, she's a newlywed bride. Don't trouble her so much. Give her the easiest pigment to make. And they gave her this little piece of red ochre earth and she put water and she just turned it round and round until it turned into a very soft, unctuous paste. After red ochre, I take you to this painting. There's a predominance of black in this. This is from the Cleveland Museum of Art. This king is going in the night. He's out hunting and he needs light. So he take, they take an earthen pot and they put uh, a, you know, a uh, um, gold leaf at the, inside the pot and they put a lamp there and the light it throws to see at night. I think this painting um, illustrates the beauty of black. Black is not always jet black. If you want the blackest of blacks, you have to, um, um, Professor Narayan Khandekar uh, from the Strauss Center of Conservation, where they have the pigment uh, compendium. I saw the Vanta black. It's vertically aligned nanotube array, it's called. It's the darkest black in the world. You see it, it light doesn't come back to you, it just disappears inside, right? That is technology of today. Uh, this is, this painting is from the um, uh, 18th century, early 18th century. And this is the black that is there. And blacks around the world have always come from a number of sources, but the most um, popular source has been carbon, which you get by lighting lamps and the suit collects at the bottom of the surface on which the flame hits, whether it is small pot like that or something supported. Uh, and then uh, the suit is collected. It's a very, very lovely black. It is created with oils and you take it and you put it in your eyes and you make kajal and you put a tikka for your children so that the evil eye does not, you know, catch the attention. It is never an evil eye, it's just an eye that doesn't catch your attention so the children don't get startled. Uh, so that's kajal for you. And that's the black which has been used across the world, across the world, across civilizations, across millennia. Red ochre, kajal are these colors. Because in that, uh, in that image, you also had the pot where the gold was used to show the light. I'm just putting gold leaf here. So gold, because it is a color, which is it's a noble metal and it does not degrade. So uh, it was used sparingly because it was expensive and they applied it as a leaf with the gum over the surface uh, in paintings, in miniature paintings. They also applied it as a very fine powder and that fine powder was made by taking a leaf of gold, uh, taking it on a, taking a surface of stone, uh, putting a thick gum on it, not too little, but nice, nicely loaded gum, and taking a piece of a folio of gold and then rubbing it with your hands, rubbing it and rubbing it, rubbing it until everything turns to a fine, it pulverizes. It almost pulverizes and then you wash it and then you let it settle down and it decants and that powder is then used mixing with the pigment to make golden, uh, to paint, apply gold on miniature paintings. Of course, they took care that they didn't put too much of um, um, gum in it. If they put too much gum, then the gold uh, brilliance, uh, the brilliance decreases. So they put just enough. And then sometimes they would put leaf also. Right? But making the gold powder is very interesting and a very, very, um, very organic uh, thing where you're, the, there's a real physical involvement with the material as the artists are making it. Now, other than the black and the reds, suddenly you find, uh, this is about 12th century AD. Um, uh, this is uh, from the Pragya Paramita. Um, from the eastern part of India, uh, the Bihar, the Bihar region, Bengal, Bihar region. 
Uh, this again is on palm leaf. Those two on top and the bottom are wooden boards on which you know the 1890 folios of the manuscript are then um, are then kept bundled together. Now you see the the colors that we see now, and these are colors that have been there since let's say earlier times, right? Early earliest of times till today. We find the same palette, unless of course contemporary colors are used. So here you find the reds, darker reds, richer, more richer reds. You find the blues and the yellows and the greens and the whites coming in. The text is often black, sometimes red also, but more for, and then there is yellow used for corrections, right? But text essentially is black more often than not. And the other colors that you keep finding here, these reds are a mineral called cinnabar, which they also call hingul. That's it, that's cinnabar. This red that we see here, I don't know if there's a cursor that you can see as I take it around here, but this is, if I annotate, I'll annotate, I'll take a mouse, yeah. Yeah, so this, this is a red, this red, these reds, this red. This deep red comes from, comes from the cinnabar. Is this ribbon disturbing anybody? Is it on the screen, the ribbon? Or is the screen clearly with the visual? It's fine? It's fine? Okay, fine. So this is cinnabar. It's a mineral called hingul. It's mercury sulfide. It's mercury. Almost 70% of this is mercury. Uh, the rest of the 30%, of course, there are gradations, but the rest of the about 25 to 30% is the sulfur component in it. And it's mined everywhere. It's taken and it's ground and then it's filtered and then the filter is ground again. And uh, this is how it is created. But please remember, people have been, there's mercury amalgam gilding that is also done in sculptures. It's a different context. But since health and safety came into play in terms of the consciousness of people or of the patrons, that where are we getting these colors from? People who produce this now, they're very careful because mercury is supposed to be toxic supposed to be. Mercury is toxic, right? So, but earlier on, people took their necessary precautions, but they were not overtly disturbed by the toxicity of these things. We must remember also that all these are also materials that are used by the Ayurvedic medical practitioners. Mr. Singh also talked about it, the medicine. In fact, they, they distill mercury out of the same mineral. They take this mineral, crush it, mix it with lemon juice, a lot of lemon juice for about two, three hours almost. And then they heat it in, in a recept, a pot here and a pot at the top and the vapors of mercury collect on the pot on top and these little liquid mercury then you can take and you can get pure mercury. You can create it like this at home if you want. I'm not advising you to do that at all. But this is how mercury was created with grindstones. Then there was another, there were other reds. There was Geru, which was red ochre, iron oxide. Then there is Hingul or cinnabar or mercury sulfide. There was also red lead. Red lead, which is, it's a brighter red. It's almost like Sindur, they call it sometimes. Right, it is this. It is this color. This, if you see the cursor, this one is the red lead. This painting, Emperor Akbar had commissioned this painting. This is the 
Mahabharat translated into Persian. Al Baruni Badawni, Badawni. And um, uh, this is in the CSMBS collection. This was conserved. And during for that conservation, they had analyzed all the various pigments here. Where red lead was this one. This one was cinnabar, mercuric sulfide. And these were the ochres. These reddish diluted ones were the ochres. This was the ochre. This Bhishma Pitama explaining to Yudhishthira how important it is to uh, donate to people in a time of crisis or for earning piety, for earning merit as an act of piety. But how is it that you distinguish the three reds? So one of the straightforward techniques, there are lots of confirmatory tests also. One of them is X-ray fluorescence where a bundle of X-rays and X-rays are thrown onto the material and the materials almost like make a sound. They throw out some energy and the machine reads up that voice and say, Are, ye voice mercury ki hai. This voice, this sound or this wavelength is of mercury or this wavelength is of iron. So if I have two reds, one has iron oxide and one is mercury sulfide and they both look the same, because that sound was or that wavelength was of mercury, I will say, ah, mercury, that means this red is probably mercury sulfide. So you build up on that information and deduce which pigment it is. So this is how they deduce it. So it gives a graph like this. It's a nice sound, shoo, like this here of mercury. This peak is of mercury here. This is iron here on the various shells of the atoms. So that was a portable X-ray fluorescence machine. This is a RTX machine, which is you know more in a in, in a place where it, it has to be fixed. So it's part of a project we had done with Dresden where. Uh, pigments were analyzed. This was when we had gone to treat some paintings for them there. The, the, this, the upper uh, images of the conservation center in Bombay where this was done. And then pigments were analyzed. This is from the Panchatantra. This lovely flower that you see here, this flower is red lead. This beautiful flower. These are the stories which delighted us as children, which eventually traveled all over the world. Aesop's fable formed and so many things happened. They were composed in Kashmir by Vishnu Sharma. The opening paragraph of this book says, when Vishnu Sharma shrewdly gleaning all worldly wisdom's inner meaning, in these five books, the Panchatantra, in these five books, the charm compresses of all such books the world possesses. And so Emperor Akbar, had this translated into a manuscript called Anwar Suheli. One of the copies which is at the CSMBS, there's one at SOAS and other places in the world. Here, again from the Anwar Suheli, the congregation of the birds, this here is red ochre. This is red ochre. All varying shades of red ochre. This one here was Sinaba on the wings of the birds. It is not only the reds which are similar to each other and have to be analyzed. Whites are even more conflicting. We have whites from conch shells from the sea. We have whites from ancient times from zinc. Zinc oxide, zinc was used from very ancient times. In fact, to create copper, you need zinc. So, and uh, copper has been around from 3000 BC also. So you have the zinc white and you have the white clays and you have lead carbonate. So these were the four principal whites that have been used around the world. 
remember across the world human beings the various civilizations have all arrived at materials that have stood the test of time be it paper as a support be it pigments be it the dyes be it the binders be it the lime mixtures all over the world when there was no communication as we have today people arrived eventually in time at the same formulation pretty much the same formulations look at this beautiful painting which exemplifies white i really love this painting sonia the curator at the um, cleveland museum of art invited me to give a lecture there and that was the time i saw some of these paintings uh, they are really beautiful this is uh, look at the bhav isme wo dashrath ka dehant ho gaya hai king dashrath is no more he is dead so now bharat and shatrughan the two brothers have to go to the forest where rama the eldest brother is in exile with lakshman to tell him that hey dad is no more so they going across from ayodhya over to give that news and the artist has created all this in a beautiful you know the color of white the the calmness of white not just the sadness but the you know the beauty of white when you use zinc white when you find indian miniature paintings with zinc white uh, you will see it breaks and cracks so zinc white is not a very good material for miniature paintings but people have used it people have used these four materials lead carbonate is good it is strong it stays for a long time but it darkens if you ever see whites which have darkened into a brownish hue or a blackish hue or you see pinks often which was white mixed with the red ochre or the mostly with the cinnabar if you find black color on it be assured that there would be a bit of white on it uh in terms of lead carbonate the leads darken the clay clays when you see the documentation of mines in india you will find you know all the clays are used for ceramic industry painting is a off side uh, something they pick up in a little bit and take it home to work but the reserves for uh, clay run into millions of tons millions of tons and different there are different uh, grades of clay uh, uh, in rajasthan there is this um, there are lots of mines there and um, um there are some very very fine clays that you find in the udaipur uh, division uh, very very fine clays that you find there and this is a conch shell white where the conch shell by the way white is the most difficult this is of course from the clays but this is the conch shell white which is being ground it is the most difficult color one of the most difficult colors to create the grinding of the conch shell is where you need the toughest person to and she is the lady of the house she is the matriarch here and look at that silpatta of hers it is huge that pestle and mortar there is huge unlike the one for the red ochre where it was a small stone which she was uh, using and this creates the white the yellows in miniature paintings the most common yellows in the miniature paintings are the yellow ochre which is the yellow earth uh, there is the indian yellow which they say comes from cows they say cow is urine we learned that we also passed that information down to a lot of people but i'm beginning to have some doubts on that now uh, but indian yellow they said that you feed cows mango leaves and then the urine becomes um, they get sick which is true there is a it's a there's a phenolic compound in uh, uh kolmangi ferin in uh, mango leaves and too much of that cause bovine uh, intestinal disorders that's true um so they said you dried that and then they were sold as balls of indian yellow 
and then there was odd pigment which was also known as haritaal this painting this parshuram being humbled in a way by ram so this bright yellow that you see here this case was indian yellow often you find indian yellow and you also find odd pigment in other places of course not mixed together right yellow ochre not so much not so much but odd pigment was predominantly the pigment that was used and then to a little lesser extent indian yellow and then yellow ochre uh, but also depended on the various regions of india and here they analyzing the different uh, the different um, Uh, yellows here. That's odd pigment for you on the left, and that she is grinding the yellow. That's odd pigment and arsenic sulfide. Again, arsenic. Again, ultra poisonous. No, arsenic sulfide used mixed with the gum. Now, called odd pigment or haritaal. now there was another there's another arsenic sulfide one is arsenic sulfide one is arsenous sulfide the other one is this yellow which is also called railgar or mansil in in local language they call it mansil manishila in fact even in the this red you see this reddish one the red one that's the mansil in fact it looks bloody in the in fact now that we're talking about in the mahabharat in the in the one of the saddest stories in the mahabharat is the death of karna and when karna dies this great warrior who was who was excluded the story of exclusion he was excluded as a child he was excluded as a student he was excluded as a person who was with the princes and other people even though he was the greatest of all warriors he was the strongest he was the he was the most accomplished of but he was excluded and even in death his mother disowned him and his death sabse marmik kahani hai uski karna ki so in the karna parv uh, of the mahabharat there is talk about when when karna was impaled by arrows jab bana vidhi ho gaye the to he fell like a mountain of manashila ek manashila ke parvat ki tarah dharti par gire so there is that thing about karna falling down and it expresses it right in these ancient uh, oral traditions and which eventually got transcribed uh, in the mahabharat there is the reference of manashila and this was also this was also so often orpiment and the orpiment uh, railgar the both forms of it often found together also at times so sometimes people get a little confused as to what is this because it is red but this is yellow so please remember this is also something that we find in uh, miniature paintings Uh, that little especially when you're doing analysis this is what we find as differences and then the yellow earth and the uh, for all the pigments that we saw even earlier the powder is then taken and then mixed in a gum and then stored as little little pellets and then the artist can carry them with them and when they need to paint they take it out mix it with the gum again and some water and they create the paint and we're talking about the colors used in paintings were they always pigments were they never vegetable colors there were this kasuli this is a flower which gives a yellow there are other materials this is a resin a gum resin right this was also used to create a yellow yellowish sort of a um, color almost also as a tone changer for example if you wanted a green now greens in india are very difficult to find huh, as such you don't have this profusion of greens in a miniature paintings but when you do it is often an indigo of a blue over which a very fine uh, layer of this yellow has been painted over to give the effect of green sometime when the water falls on the paintings you say are ye to blue ho gaya ye to hari ghas thi this was a green field it's become blue it's got altered it's not got altered is the surface layer of things like this that have come away the glazes the yellow glazes rupamakhi even this was used sometimes to create 
you know, the skin shades, lupa maki. So there are lots of these things. And to differentiate this, this is uh, the the people here, Omkar and Lalit, uh, Lalit Pathak, um, great pain, pain, paper conservator. Omkar is at the CSMBS. Earlier, there was Nikhil that you saw on the analysis, XRF analysis. They are doing Omkar Kardu and all they are doing the they're doing uh, uh, ultraviolet fluorescence analysis. So ultraviolet light is being put on a painting and like your banknotes, they glow like that. Paintings also glow. So the painting on the left, when you put ultraviolet light on it, it glows like this. And then you can identify what that glow is from. Which paint is it from? Is it from orpiment? Is it from Indian yellow? Is it an ochre? So everything has, is it a retouching? So everything glows differently. Is there a varnish on top that will glow a different color? Okay. For Indian yellow, for Indian yellow, people find the story very dramatic of cows getting sick and you collect the... Uh, by the way, in 1908, uh, the Indian yellow was banned. The production of Indian yellow was banned. Well, if it was banned, then obviously something was happening. Though there are no documentary proof whether it was really created like that by feeding, forcibly feeding mango leaves to bovines, buffaloes, to cows, whatever. But in the Panchatantra, from the Panchatantra as translated by Ryder, see it says in a beautiful verse, the moon its rise from ocean takes and gems proceed from hoods of snakes. From cows, bile, yellow dye stuffs come and fire and wood is quite at home. The worthy by display of worth attain distinction, not by birth. But there's a reference to it. From cows buy yellow dye stuffs come. And if you take out the gallstones, even from the human body, <laughs> there are two types of gallstones, the cholesterol gallstones and the pigmented gallstones. The pigmented ones have this brownish yellow hue. And yesterday at night, I was actually checking out with my with a, a colleague of mine who had done his PhD on uh, bovine, bovine intestinal microflora. Um, um, uh, the, the gallstones in cows also have this yellowish dye stuff. And there is another thing called gorachana, which is something like in the pituitary gland here, the cows. That also, if you see the cross section, that also has a yellowish thing. But, but the cross section of the um, gallstones found very similar to, so there's something to be worked on, right? So there's something to be worked on. So Indian yellow is... It's a beautiful color, by the way. It's a really beautiful color. But all these colors are pigments. That means they're dry powders. They're dry powders. You have to mix them with something. You have to mix them with a the gum. You have to mix them with a the binder. So you have your, you have gums, you know, gums. In 19, uh, I, uh, I was reading the, the, um, uh, the reports of the uh, the trade trade in India. There was in the 60s the amount of gum that was transacted from India was six lakh tons, and it it got you uh, about twenty thousand crores, twenty thousand crores as revenue from exports of gums and resins from India. It's a huge market. And it's interesting that because now it has all been industrialized, it is interesting that the painting artists today and the people who make the ajrak, people who make the, uh, the handicrafts and the handlooms, it is so difficult for them to get gum from the trees because everything is now controlled by the forest departments. Of course, for reasons and revenue departments. For these people to get that little one kilo or half a kilo or 500 grams of gum is so difficult. But these are the different gums. The khair gum is supposed to be better than the acacia and other gums. And then you take the gum, you mix it with the pigment and you put them in receptacles. And these are the ones in which artists use to create the paints. And somebody asked me a couple of days back, one of where do they, where do you get these colors from? And you know where we get these colors from as we talked? These colors were always used by the medicine men. 
see, there were these pilgrimage centers and people travel to these centers. And along the centers, along these routes, you will always find art. And there were people who created this art. So you will find these pigments that these were the color routes, I think, of the country. And traders from where they, uh, traders from where they um, got uh, the raw materials would sell them to the Ayurveda shops, to the medicine shops. So today, if you want to buy a bit of Hingul, don't run around to an art store. Go to an Ayurveda shop and he will give you the kasuli, he will give you the madar manjisht ka root, and he will also give you the uh, gurchana and he will also give you the cinnabar and the Hingul and the hartal and everything. So that was what it was. The blue. I have just a few more minutes now, taking you to the last of the few colors, the blue. Earlier, the blue came from the mines in Afghanistan, a little bit in India. Now you find them in a bit of Africa, also in South America. You find now Lapis, lapis Lazuli, Lajvard or the Rajvard. That was mined from Afghanistan. It was an expensive commodity. The other blue that was used was indigo, which is a dye, but it was precipitated onto a white inert base. And that was sold as Khandanil or Neel. And that was also used sometimes as pigments. So in the expensive miniature, miniature paintings, which were, which were commissioned by patrons, uh, blue was used. Colors were always used sparingly. They were never wasted, like we paint and then we wash away the entire palette. People were very probity. People were very... In fact, any any person who's great at his mestiere, any person who's great at his profession, they know how to use the optimum amount of material and not waste and throw it away. So was the case with pigments. We go to the northeast of India, up in the mountains of Tawang. The indigos that were used. The azurite was the other color that was also used, but very, very sparingly. sparingly. Malachite and azurite were very, very sparingly found in Indian miniature painting. Often it was the indigos or the lapis lazuli. Here they've used indigo and then dyed it a little bit. Indigo they brought from the Bengal area. Carried it via Tezpur all the way up Bomdila, Sela, Tawang. And then, for example, in this painting, in this image, if you can see, you can see the blue here. This blue is indigo. And I'm just giving you a narration. This blue is indigo, right? The green is indigo and a yellow. See, in, uh, yellows were not, uh, greens were not always easy to find. Uh, green ochre, terra verde, green earth in some places, rarely. Malachite, almost never, right? But Indigo and yellows mixed together or blue with a glaze on top of how greens were often prepared. Another way of making green in India was black and yellow. That was often used. Right? The lighter blue is again lapis lazuli, but mixed with a bit of white, with a lead white. Right? The, um, the, um, the river was silver. The river is silver, which has got tarnished. And it's not possible to remove the tarnish because the layer is so thin, it'll disappear. Tin was sometimes used in writing, tin. They would take tin and they'll put some water in it and they'll take gum in it and beat it and beat it until it pulverizes. And they mix it with water and gum and they paint. And after they paint, they burnish it so that the tin then shines. That was how they applied tin on paintings and on manuscripts. Manuscript very rarely, but yeah. In India, the miniature paintings were not just paintings, they often had text with them. So they were illustrated manuscripts, so to speak, illuminated manuscripts. So, and then you have gold on the background, you have the gold there, right? And the red is a red lead. The red is a red lead here. The reds that you see, right, they're red leads. This one is a cinnabar. There was one cinnabar here. There was a little, so cinnabar and red lead were the leads used. So this way you can create a pattern by analyzing different places. Nowadays, you also have an XRF machine which can analyze the whole painting and it gives you a complete image, 
uh, elemental image of the whole thing. Uh, one of the machines by Brooker is called Elio, and that is what what is used. Uh, this one I show you for a blue here. This is a painting again at CSMVS, Balwan Singh in his ten. This blue. And this green and the yellow. I show these three together because these were interrelated with each other. The blues and the greens were the yellows often. The last of the colors that I'll be talking about. This is Verdi Greece or the green of Greece or Janghal. One of the world's oldest manufactured, one of the oldest manufactured pigments. So it is such a calm color to the eye, but deceptive. Because wherever it touches, you see the sky, this lovely sky where the birds are flying here. On the back of this, if you see, it has made it brown. And in another decade, this painting will lose all that paper where the brown is. That paper will fall off, like as if it has been cut by a laser machine. And it will disappear. It destroys the paper which supports it. But it was a beautiful color and people loved it. These are the other various materials that are used, which have a vegetable organic origin. That's why I've kept them here now. These are the various materials also used in miniature paintings, which are used to embellish and give tonalities to the various uh, pigments. Different types of pigments. So this is like, and this is continuing even today. Here, this is a very, very strong use of opiment here with the cinnabar, this paintings. And people today are creating works of art which still have these colors. And people continue to write on paper and create manuscripts. And people continue to make miniature paintings. And people are continuing to make uh, uh, illustrated uh, manuscripts as an act of piety and as an act of service by retranscribing manuscripts again and again and again. And you find them in all the Granthagars in India and all the Bhagavad Gharas of India. This is of course from the 16th century. Illustrations from the Anwari Suheli, the use of color over centuries, this is 15th century, 16th century, the beautiful use of colors. And all this also helps us to conserve the collections, conserve our traditions, perpetuate them. And as a tool, analysis of pigments as a tool in India, I think is something that we need to take up and uh, uh, give the local terms to the binders and the pigments because there's so many. It is only then that we will be able to understand um, the true depth of our painting traditions. English terms are good, German terms, Italian terms are good, but we are losing the essence if we do not use the vernacular terminologies. And not Hindi, not just Hindi. Hindi is one of it. In every region of India, we, in India, we have local terms for these, and that has to be brought into the platform where we can converse Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That's it. These are being conserved. And uh, this is the story of the colors of the Indian subcontinent, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Dr. C, if you want to say something. Sir, can you stop the PowerPoint presentation, sharing option? You want me to switch it off? I'll go off the screen. Stop share. One second. Dr. Singh, you start. Audio. Sir, sir, apna audio unmute kar le, sir. Audio, audio unmute kar le, sir.
Ma'am, can I just, um, uh, Mr. Singh, can I just say something? One, I'll take about 30 seconds. Yes, please. Say, say, say. Um, one thing is, uh, people often feel uh, that would analyzing the colors damage the painting? Uh, no, analyzing colors uh, in objects, you have to do non-destructive analysis. Uh, it doesn't get spoiled, it doesn't get destroyed. And papers which are dyed blue or dyed yellow, everything can be analyzed. Even those can be analyzed and the ones that are painted can be analyzed. And uh, there are lots of books for pigments that uh, if you can share the email because there are questions that are coming in, we can answer them uh, later on. So, wo kapya share kar dijega, huh? And I will explain, uh, somebody is asking why turmeric was never used for creating yellow color. Right? I'll just write to them and answer them. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. S.P. Singh, I disturbed you. Anupanji, you have covered the whole scenario across the subcontinent, the use of colors. Excellent presentation. I must thank you. But few observations. There are a number of challenges when you actually do it. For example, I was supposed to do frescoes in the Golden Temple, the Shani Deori. But I, I, am not happy, I am not convinced that the colors which I am getting from Udaipur or from the market will be pure pigments. Then I had to buy the colors, the actual laboratory colors, of course not contaminated, pure, pure uh, pigments that I used on the frescoes and five years it has been worked upon. So they have not at all done, they are created press course. This is a great challenge. People don't get the right colors nowadays. And uh, of course, uh, the traditions, if you, if, you, if you go to Iran, if you go to our people in, across Rajasthan, you will find still people making pigment, but very few craftsmen left. The unfortunate part is the craftsmen are very less to make, but people don't buy it. That is the problem. But you told another question, analysis. Analysis is possible. I have analyzed Rajasthan miniature painting using actual fluorescence in the National Museum. Number of miniature painting I got it analyzed through actual fluorescence. Then I showed and make a presentation on this without any destruction because there's no destruction. If we use the laboratory, laboratory chemicals, there's of course destruction. Nobody will allow it. So that is the problem. Nowadays, there are a number of non invasive techniques through which we can go through analysis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anupam Shah and Sangamitra and my colleagues and the participants in the art lovers across the country and subcontinent who have enjoyed the Anupam Shah's lecture. And Sangamitra always enthusiastically supporting the cause of conservation in India, especially manuscripts. She has a number of publications. I have told you just now. Thank you. Thank she you, sir. Thank She's you, four volumes of Guru Granth Sahib. Thank you, sir. On behalf of National Mission for Manuscripts, thank I you thank, very much. I, on behalf of National Mission for Manuscripts, I thank Sri Anupam Shah for agreeing to be the speaker of today's Tattabada lecture. Sir, we are enriched by your presentation of how the colors are created. We just see the miniatures and appreciate. We didn't know the history geography of it. It was so interesting and informative lecture. The mission is going to publish this in its Sattavada series. So we request you to submit this presentation uh, with illustration in an article form as soon as possible. Our sincere thanks go to the chairperson Dr. S.P. Singh, who is an authority on the subject. Sir, we are grateful to you for your presence in this program today as the chairperson. You also have enlightened us nowadays in Harmandir Shah in Golden Temple. How do you manage all these colors? Now we know how difficult it is to get the color. As we are running out of Zoom time, question and cessation cannot be accommodated here. I request uh, Dr. Abhijit Dixit, can you put up the email of the speaker in the screen so that whoever wants to approach the speaker uh, in, with any query can contact him in the, through the mail. Dr. Abhijit, can you... Ma'am, it, ma it is there in chat box. Sir, already shared there. Okay, have you shared it? Okay, thank you. 
with this i end today's satavad lecture session thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you thank you for everybody who joined us thank you so much thank you sir thank you very much sir right in and um, if you want to call in with the questions that's the number 9927471 Yeah, but send a message. Huh? Send a message over. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sangamitra Basu. Thank you, Dr. S. P. Singh. Thank Achal. you, Dr. Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma so, should I leave the session? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, Abhijit. You. Thank you. Any more Thank questions? You. Let me just see. Okay. There are a lot of lot of questions, sir. Yeah. But I you will send the mail, no? May his yeah, mail. Yeah, definitely like they will send the mail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Good evening. Bye bye.